Hello and welcome to another Trib Talk Town Hall. I'm Jennifer Napier Pierce, Executive Editor of the Salt Lake Tribune. We're now more than two weeks into protests that call for change with most of that energy focused on police reform and with good reason. According to the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, police violence is a leading cause of death for all young men in America, but it's highest for young black men. In fact, the odds of being killed by police for black men are about one in 1,000. Tonight, we're confronting that grim reality head on and looking for a path forward. Joining me is Lex Scott. She's founder of Black Lives Matter Utah. Lex, good to see you. Good to see you, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Chief Mike Brown is with the Salt Lake City Police Department. Chief, welcome. Thank you. Chief Rodney Chapman is with the University of Utah's Department of Public Safety. And Chief, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. And Dr. Diane McAdams-Jones is Associate Professor of Nursing at Utah Valley University. She's also an expert in social justice. And Professor, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. And we're taking questions and thoughts as well. Send those to uh, the hashtag Trib Talk if you have uh, something to contribute about police aggression and reform. Um, Lex, I want to start with you. There's a lot of there's a lot of anger and frustration out there right now. What are you seeing in the social unrest, both here in Salt Lake City and the protests around the globe? You know, I see. People are definitely fed up with police brutality, um, but I I see a lot of good though, you know, happening. I see a beautiful revolution. I see change. I see people waking up. I see legislators calling my phone nonstop about police reform. Um, if you're Black Lives Matter, we've been ignored for six years, and now people are paying attention to us, people are listening to us, and we're, we're making real change. So a lot of people just see unrest, um, but I see a beautiful change in this nation that I hope lasts more than a month, more than two months. Well, I, I guess I have to ask uh, Professor McAdams Jones, you know, we have seen this kind of outcry before. It's not the first time when people have taken to the streets and they've been fed up. Um, what do you think makes this time different? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm close to seven decades into this. I remember the 60s. I lived through the 70s in Tuskegee, down in Alabama, Montgomery, Birmingham. I've often said that these things happen. We get excited, we tear up a few things, we express ourselves, and then things go back to normal. I wish we didn't do that. In 2015, my heart sunk when I lived exactly one block away from the Saratoga Springs incident with Darian Hunt. Because my children are brown, I couldn't sleep. So I did contact the police department and I have been working with the police department in Orem and Provo for the past five years. There was a time when Chief Brown was involved. Uh, we've sort of uh, bifurcated at points, not necessarily in belief systems, but in places where we work. So we haven't done anything jointly, but the conversations have to continue. And I call them conversations on race because I'm not so sure I believe in implicit bias training. I don't know that you can change people's bias. You can probably bring them to the surface, but unless you bring them to the surface where I acknowledge it, then I'm not gonna be able to recognize that I have those biases. So as long as I don't recognize it, I may still be acting upon them. And for that reason, I think we need to continue to have conversations. We need to continue to work together as community, and police, because that's how you change, is you find a place in the middle where you can work together. Since George Floyd's death um, on Memorial Day, I mean, law enforcement has just been hammered. Um, do you think that any of the criticism is unfair or is all of this fair comment? And um, Chief Brown, I'll start with you. <clears throat> um, 
Look, uh, policing is a difficult job. Um, I've been doing it now for 30 years. When I hired on, it was right during the Rodney King riots in LA. And I had senior officers telling me, I'm glad I'm getting in. Good luck with what you do. It's a difficult job. And there's always been scrutiny. There's always been problems. And, and, and I go back, I mean, we've had uh, Rodney King. We go back to Ferguson. We go back to Baltimore, New York, Chicago. And then we even had a situation here in Salt Lake City, Rio Grande. And so there's always been an outcry uh, for law enforcement to engage with the community. So it's nothing new. It's just we now seriously, as law enforcement, we need to reform. And ref reform starts with agencies and leaders that are willing to sit down to listen, learn, and then act to affect change in this country. And but so how, that has been. I Go mean, ahead, no. haven't you been involved in, in extended discussions with Black Lives Matter and other uh, activists and protests? Whenever there is an incident, there is an outcry. Right. What makes this different, Chief? Well, it, here's, here's the thing. There's not a playbook. I wish there was a playbook that said, here's the playbook to run a police department. That doesn't exist. If there was a big red easy button, we had to push that button a long time ago. Law the only consistent thing in law enforcement is it changes. And we need to engage and work with the communities that we work, uh, that we, that we, uh, that we uh, police and that we interact with. I mean, following the Rio Grande situation, uh, Lex Scott, I met Lex, uh, she, was, she was out demonstrating and protesting. And I said, Lex, can we get together and can we talk? And Lex said, absolutely, Chief. And so for the last about every two and a half, two weeks, Lex, we have sat down and had hard discussions and we've made a lot of improvements. But again, you're never, this is an ever changing profession and it, it, you continually need to, to work on the things that we do so that we can, we can come together as, a, as law enforcement and community to better serve all of the, all of the, all the people in our communities. Chief Chapman, uh, you've only been in Utah for a few months, but you've been in law enforcement for uh, many years. Uh, and, and you're hearing these repeated calls for systemic change. Is there something about the culture of law enforcement that, that cultivates, that um, protects racist attitudes? Well, I think we engage in these conversations at a deficit because the profession itself has not done a great job in acknowledging the role that the profession has played in systemic racism. So for instance, if you are, we all know that uh, racism has existed um, throughout the entire history of our country. Right. However, whatever aspect of it, whether it's Jim Crow laws or uh, segregation, separate but not equal, whatever it is, it can't exist unless you have a law enforcement arm to in enforce whatever it is. Somebody who says you can't sit here or you can't have access to needs to be able to call somebody uh, when that situation comes up. And police have been on the other end of that phone. And so police as a profession needs to go into these conversations with an acknowledgement of how our profession has played a role in systemic racism and how when we approach you, we uh, police officers will, will approach a, a, a situation and say from the attitude that I have the authority to be here and that's their perspective. But the person that they are approaching they know that they have a history of how that authority has played a part in their subjugation. And unless we acknowledge that first, when we sit down and have these conversations, I don't think those conversations can be as productive as they could potentially be. Is this personal for you? You're a black man. Have you faced racism within the ranks, within a, a police organization? And how have you dealt with that? Well, what I've done at, and on a professional level, when I've seen an officer engaged in less than excellence, and that could be 
in any form or fashion. They did not give the requisite uh, attention to. They don't didn't demonstrate the certain skills on a particular incident. I call it out. Um, as an African American man, uh, I don't think any African American men in the United States have not experienced racism in the job and in their communities. It's just, it's a story, it's part of the fabric of our existence here. And so I understand that and it does resonate differently from me because as you look at the what's taking place in our, our country right now, it's people who look like me who are finding themselves on the wrong end of uh, what has been taking place historically. I, 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 as a black man, I've experienced it. And as a black man, I've had to have those conversations with my sons. And so uh, it is personal for me. And um, as you mentioned, I've only been here 121 days. Um, but um, what I view my role here is to say, we are going to acknowledge things that have occurred in the past. We have to. And we can't go forward unless we authentically put people around the table to have a voice because the community is saying, you know, Lex was just saying, uh, Black Lives Matter has been ignored for basically six years. Um, what they are saying isn't anything different than my grandpa Bell was saying. Um, what we need to do is stop hearing and start listening. And that listening piece is, we're gonna put people around the table because the community doesn't want policing done to them. They want policing done in collaboration with them. Mm. Uh, can we talk about money? Um, defunding the police has become a rallying cry. Uh, Lex, explain the thinking behind it. Well, okay, so people want to defund the police and every single person, if you ask them what that means, they're going to have a different response. Right. Okay? Some people want to di divest. Some people want to bankrupt the police department. Some people want to reallocate funds. They want to take funds away from for-profit prisons. They want to take funds away from programs like having SROs in the schools, school resource officers in the schools. Um, and they want to put that into minority people of color communities. Um, and, and that's all well and good. And I, I completely support defunding the police. I just want to get that on record. Um, however, will defunding the police make them stop killing us? I don't know. So my number one focus, and I people are just being really critical of me right now. Um, my number one focus is getting the independent civilian review boards that have the power to subpoena police, investigate police, and bring charges against police because police agencies are investigating other police agencies and finding themselves innocent. Um, police should not be allowed to investigate their own crimes. It is a conflict of interest. And it is my theory that if a police officer believes when he pulls that trigger that, that he will have an investigation and possibly be charged with a crime, he might be less likely to pull that trigger, to choke that suspect to death, to put his knee on that suspect's neck, to run them over like in Sandrea Europe's case, to shoot through that bathroom door like in the Diamante Revore case. Um, and so my number one focus is police accountability and transparency. I want, uh, in. I wrote a police reform bill and I've been shopping it around. I've been shopping it around. You know, legislators are just calling me off the hook. But my thing is data collection, right? We need to have data collection for police so that when we say, hey, police are pulling over black and brown people at five times the rate of white people, um, and we're getting higher sentences for lesser crimes, we actually have that data. We have the data that the police gave us that shows that they truly are pulling us over more. And once we have data collection of the shootings, um, in custody death rates, everything that we have, we can take that information and that data and then we can say, okay, this is what is wrong in policing. These are things that need to be fixed how do we hold police accountable? So everyone's <laughs> number one focus right now is defunding the police. That's amazing. Take their money. Don't give them militarized gear. Take their MRAPs. That's fine. But my number one focus right now 
is holding police accountable so that they cannot continue to murder black and brown people. I want to get back to the accountability piece. Um, we're getting some questions on Facebook about it, but um, Chief Brown, the defund the police is not theoretical for you right now. Salt Lake City Council last night voted unanimously to cut the police budget by 3%. Um, it's just a fraction of what dozens of uh, residents resoundingly came to the meeting and said that they wanted, but one councilman said this, this was just the beginning of an evaluation. Um, I, I would love to get your reaction to that defund the police uh, rhetoric. Well, uh, Jennifer, I, I have for the last couple of weeks, I've, I've uh, listened to those council meetings. I've been involved with the, the discussions with our council and, and we, the police department have heard what the public have stated. And I completely understand what the expectation of the council is. Um, but after having these discussions and the things that we came up with, the, the three things that they really focused on were not cutting the number of officers, but they wanted to fund, um, substantially fund uh, our body worn cameras um, to update them. Right now, ours are at, I mean, we, we've had cameras for four or five years now. We were on, on the front end of, of the agencies that jumped in. We were one of the first agencies. Our cameras are, the wires are breaking, the batteries don't hold a charge. I mean, they're, they're antiquated and out of date. And so when we have cameras, that increases the transparency within our organization. That helps build trust with the communities that we serve. That trust is a commodity that we need that, so that we can come together as a community and a police department to better serve and to better, uh, to do the things that we need to do uh, here in Salt Lake City. The other thing they talked about was training. Um, they, they wanted to set aside some money for training. Now over the last four, three or four years, we've embarked on a lot of training. We've, we've, we've done Blue Courage training. We've done Arbinger training. We've done Fair and Impartial Policing training. Um, now there's money set aside and a commission that Mayor Mendenhall is putting together that we can actually have uh, discussions with people from the community to talk about our policies and uh, our practices. But more important, where we need to go as a police department as far as how we train our officers, what are the expectations of the community? So we now have money to, to, to get the very best training in the country and bring that into to our police department to, to be a better, a better agency. And then the other thing is we are going to fund our social workers um, to the tune of $2.8 million. Now, I've said many times, um, those that are, there are those that are addicted. There are those that are dealing with mental health issues and there are those that are experiencing um, homelessness. Please tell me which one of those are a crime. Yet we continue to use law enforcement as the tip of the spear to engage you know, people that are suffering, suffering with those, uh, those issues. Social workers allow us to bring individuals that are trained professionals uh, to help us find uh, resources, uh, treatment, whatever it might need so that we can fix the problem rather than trying to arrest our way out of it because we're never gonna be able to do that. So I'm, I'm very happy. Forgive me, uh, Professor, I'd love to get your take on Salt Lake City's approach for more training, more social workers, um, better body cam equipment to keep the accountability high. What's your take? Love it. I think it's absolutely what is needed. I've gone on rides with the police department down here. And one night I was on a ride and all night long, it was domestic calls, which would have been much better served with a social worker. I have three children who ha are licensed PhDs, masters in mental health, social work. That's the kind of thing that they do. And that's where they need to be to mitigate those situations. Police officers don't really have that kind of training. But like the chief said, that they're the ones that get called. If you hit 911, you probably get fire, you get the police, you get uh, EMTs, but that's not their uh, area of training. So it's a lot to put on a police officer. And when you look at what's required to be a police officer, sometimes in some states, you don't even have to have a college degree and you can be a, a police officer. Most of it's just high school. So training to handle human behavior, I have been a nurse 
for 48 years, human behavior is one of the most difficult things to change. As a matter of fact, you don't hardly ever change human behavior. You have to try to manage it. So to have police officers out there trying to manage that, that's huge. So I totally 100% agree. Put social workers there and pay them to do that job. What's your take on the whole defund the police? I mean, Lexa said there are different ways of interpreting that phrase. How do you interpret? Well, I understand it the same way Lex understands it. It's defund, there's reform, and there's dismantle. Dismantling is foolish, just like dismantling healthcare insurance the way we had. You can't dismantle it unless you get something better. So you don't dismantle it until you got an answer. You know where you're going to land before you jump. You don't know what it looks like on the other side. You can't start dismantling. So that's out. So reforming, that's another way to manage it. And yes, this is some of what Chief is talking about, redistributing money, getting more money so you can reform how things are done. I'm for that. Defunding is what Lex said. That just means some of the extraneous money, extraneous money that we've been using to militarize police, SWAT teams, that's exciting. But you can't take play cops and robbers like that on people's lives. Because once a bullet hits, that's it. I'm a nurse, I can tell you. We can't fix bullets in the head. There's a lot of things we can fix. Bullets in the head, bullets in the heart, we can't fix. So bullets don't also don't always work. If you can de-escalate that situation without that type of force. I was also in the military. I'm a major United States Army for some years. The fact of the matter is, you don't need to have them militarized either. So I'm for taking that kind of money away, but if it can be placed in training, like Chief talked about, all for that. Hmm. Uh, Chief Chapman, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the militarization. Um, I don't think that anybody ever thought that they'd see armored vehicles and um, you know, people in full military garb out on the streets of Salt Lake City. Um, in your experience, does that work? Is that something police departments should be doing? getting, you know, decommissioned equipment from the Army? Well, for, there's a lot of things that keep coming up related to training. And training is uh, a key factor in that you can pre present training across a broad spe a spectrum of things, but how is that training conducted? Is there follow-up on that training? Are police officers being held accountable to that? Are supervisors supervising their officers in the manner in which they receive training and equipment? Are the officers engaging in role play, scenario playing? And all of those things could, could um, have an impact on how training is done. So if you provide someone with equipment, equipment and they use it improperly, um, it's not going to work. If you give them uh, the proper equipment and when the terrorists attack, or there are situations in which it's needed, uh, you certainly would like to have that resource on hand when it is needed. You certainly want to have the requisite training, um, know-how, accountability, duty to intervene, and all of those types of things to say it's not needed here, there's a different way. But again, it's, it's a more comprehensive uh, answer to that question and many of the things that we'll be talking about. Well, training is such a an expansive topic in itself. I mean, you mentioned de-escalation. Uh, Post, the State Police Academy announced today that it wants uh, training in implicit bias. It also wants more hand-to-hand -hand combat so that um, uh, officers are more reflexively um, going to their fists rather than to the gun. Like, does the entire training regimen need to be overhauled? Um, uh, Chief Brown. Well, I, I think uh, I think we need to look at it. Absolutely, um, I think we need to put uh, a lot of emphasis on. And, and the buzzword now is de-escalation, but it's it's better tactics. It's a, a better it's a better way that we can deploy in in situations where we're dealing with somebody that uh, uh, is having a a mental health crisis or is. Um, that, that we need more time to de-escalate with. I mean, if we go into a situation and we can find cover, um, if we can get cover, that provides time. The more time we have, we can slow down the situation. So I think we should start looking at all the different tactics that we train and look for ways to de-escalate or improve our tactics at every level. So, I mean, we can do that across the board. Yes. Uh, Chief Chapman, anything to add there? Uh, I. 
I, I concur with what he was saying as it relates to that. Um, the, one of the things as it relates to implicit bias, I know that had come up earlier. Uh, I've been in this profession for 30 years and I received a lot of racial sensitivity training and, 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 and things of the sort. And the way it was conducted was someone who has never arrested anyone, never had to confront human behavior in the moment, would come in and talk to the police and say, here's how you are bad and here's what you should do. And that just doesn't work. It doesn't res resonate with the officers. And we would need to reimagine how training is done. And so as it relates to de-escalation and uh, implicit bias, there are models out there where police officers are specifically trained in how to teach this curricula. They come in and a big part of it, and it was brought up in our conversation earlier, is to say not only um, does implicit bias exist, but here's the science behind it. Here is why, because you have a human heartbeat that you have bias, but then the next step is here is how you recognize it in the moment on the job and here are ways that you can mitigate how it affects your performance. But again, those are the, the nuances behind that type of training that we really need to reimagine how we do the training that we do. Lex, do you have confidence in the training? Um, not at all. Um, I was really excited about Arbinger when they brought it. It's very expensive and, and we appreciated it. What is that um, again? I'm sorry. Arbinger training is mm -hmm. the, the name of their training and we were really excited about it. But then I got a call from a Pacific Islander family in Cottonwood Heights who had the police come to their house 80 times. And, um, and so I met with the chief of police up there and I said, hey, maybe you guys should, you know, implement Arbinger training. And they're like, oh, we have Arbinger training. We've had that. And then, and then that's when I realized, okay, this is not always going to be effective. But, you know, when I went, I went to the NYU police reform conference last year, and it just was a game changer because they had people like me, people like Dan there. And there were, there were some police departments that had really creative ideas. There's a police department called the Washtenaw police department. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're focused, they give implicit bias training, but they test officers for implicit biases before they're hired. So they're asking them questions to identify, hey, does this person really tr truly believe most black people are criminals, you know, and, and brown people are criminals? Does this person have racist tendencies? Let's not hire that person. And instead of hiring someone who has all this racial insensitivity and then giving them implicit biases over and over again, um, how about we just start from the beginning? And there were so many different police departments there and activists there that had creative ideas um, of how to mitigate this. But yeah, with de-escalation training, I was really thankful for it. Um, but now I just think, yikes, you know, is it working? Are they listening? I don't, I don't know. And I have to add to what uh, Lex is saying. Again, like I said, being a nurse over all these years and watching the diabetic come and say what all they did and what they ate and they uh, did everything they were told and the numbers just don't match. Could be something else going on in their DNA. But again, the mind is a beautiful thing, but it also allows you to get comfy and it gives you balm to all of your problems. You can lie to yourself and believe your own lies. It's, it's okay to talk about Im implicit bias training. And as Chief Chapman talked about curricula, there are curricula everywhere. So if we can change the way people think or bring it to the surface, I say bring it to the surface. It takes a pure transformation in a person and they have to want to change. And if I don't agree that I have a problem, then I'm not going to probably want to change it. I like to say that in a curriculum or lots of curricula, perhaps we should have a lot of historical pieces. People don't understand why they feel the way they feel and why I feel supreme to someone else. 
And I'll say this much, and I'm not a supremacist, and I am an African-American born and raised in the cotton fields of South Carolina. The fact of the matter is if you take me into the South, nobody's gonna question that I'm African-American. They can tell that. In Utah, people don't know. My point is, is the trigger. And that is what we have. And Frederick Douglass talked about it. Alex Baldwin talked about it. We trigger by color. And that is an interesting phenomenon to look at, phenomena to look at. We, we trigger because as Frederick Douglass said, and Paul Reed has said, we have a white problem. And because we have a white problem, that's one of the things that's triggering a lot of this. So can I change the way somebody thinks? Perhaps I need to start from the root. Why do you think this way? Do you even know why you think this way? And symbols are very important to people. And back to the Chief Chapman, everybody learns differently. Probably we can take many different approaches to this. But until you know what you're dealing with, with the people with whom you're speaking, you don't exactly know what to apply. I would suggest some of it may help in some places, but with this kind of thing, you have got to be transformed because no sooner than you get in that situation, if you're not transformed, you go back to what's comfortable and what's normal. And unfortunately, I, for, for policemen, we all want them to come home too. That's not unfortunate, but I was going another place. Unfortunately, they experience a lot of hate too. And for them, whom we want to come home to, back to what I said about sitting down and talking, that's got to happen. It's got to happen in communities. It's got to happen with the police force. It has to be a together thing. And until people can sit at a table and talk and look you straight in the face and not worry about who you are and and the fact that you're going to get me or I'm going to get you, we have to understand where we came from. We're not going to be able to solve these problems because you don't heal a wound over the top. A wound heals from the bottom up and the sides in. And until it he heals from the bottom up and the sides in, it's not healed. It's healed across the top. It doesn't take any. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties with your, your video there. So I'll leave you there. I, I do want to fold in some questions from our audience. Um, these are a couple related to cameras and, and uh, Chief Brown, Chief Chapman, maybe you can chime in. This is from Trevor. Cameras are great, but what are the repercussions for officers that refuse or take off their cameras? And uh, Justin has the same sentiment. What about police officers that turn their cameras off? Um, for our law enforcement experts. Chief Brown. We have specific policies as to when those cameras should be on and when they can be off. And if we, we find that officers are abusing that, we will take the appropriate action. That will not be tolerated here at Salt Lake City Police Department. The nice thing about these new cameras, they have a lot of automatic uh, features built into them. So if an officer, um, let me back up, that's part of state law. That's, that's, I mean, you have to have your cameras on when, uh, it, in state law, it defines that. Uh, but these new cameras that we have, when you, if you should deploy your taser, your camera automatically comes on. If you pull out your sidearm, your camera automatically comes on. If you initiate the lights in the car, your camera automatically comes on. And then a 30 foot radius, any officer that's within that zone, their cameras come on. So. I mean, I know that things can get very st stressful. I've been out there with the officers. It's sometimes you may forget to hit the button. This, 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 new, this new technology kind of takes care of that for you, but we're not gonna tolerate officers turning their cameras off. Uh, Chief Chapman, uh, body cams can be your best friends. They can exonerate officers or they can be damning evidence. What's your take? I mean, do you tolerate officers swishing it off, um, any sort of manual control when things get hairy? Well, we, we, are, we will be bringing those online very shortly, but I, um, I think there isn't a policy out there or there shouldn't be a policy out there in, in this, this day and age that allows an officer to turn them off without repercussions. I, I wanna speak a little further about the cameras and suggest a lot of our conversations have been about accountability. And so one of the things that uh, needs to happen with police departments is it's one thing to have the cameras, but it, it could also be utilized 
as an early warning system for officer behavior and accountability. And so supervisors should have some system in place where they are randomly looking at body camera footage of their officers, some types of random audit of the, those uh, images that have been caught. And um, this would give them some material to say to their officers, you need more development here, you did this wrong, and, and, and address that behavior before it becomes a critical incident. Well, I, we can't talk about video um, and body cam evidence without the recent shooting of Bernardo Palacios Carvajal. Uh, we have protesters in the street right now as we're speaking, uh, raising their voices, asking for prosecution, and it's all due to the body cam video that we all saw. Lex, uh, what's your take on that? Well, um, I think that we see the outrage for that video, but I, I would like to also see outrage for the Brian Valencia family um, who was just told that the officer didn't have his body camera on or the body camera fell on the ground. So the Valencia family has been waiting for three months to find out what happened to their son, their brother, their nephew, their father. Um, and then, you know, Sheriff Rosie Rivera said, we don't have the body cam footage. Um, and so that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, also, it's a problem that, you know, we worked really hard to get a policy in Salt Lake City that all body cam footage has to be released within 10 days of every officer involved shooting. Um, and so we have that policy in Salt Lake City. But if you step out the boundaries of Salt Lake City, like Brian Valencia, and you are shot and killed by police, the police department holds on to that footage for months, for years. Um, and so there are a few bills being introduced. It's my understanding. Um, one of the bills is that all police departments in U Utah have to release that body cam footage within 10 days of every officer involved shooting. What I would, what I would like to see in the bill is have them release it on a public website and make sure that it's unedited with sound. In the Bobby Duckworth shooting, Bobby Duckworth was killed by police last year. Um, the sound was edited in the video. Um, and we find a lot of the times, you know, when Sim Gill holds his, his press conference to justify the shooting because he justifies every shooting, um, he'll slow down parts of the video. He'll, you know, he'll cut parts of the video. Um, to frame the narrative of, of the body cam footage. So, you know, and, and also the news stations that, you know, the police sometimes will send the footage to like Fox 13 and, and in uh, the Dylan Taylor case, I know Dylan Taylor's family would be scrolling down Facebook and have to watch Dylan Taylor get killed over and over and over again. Um, and it was horrific that, you know, these are human lives. Um, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be George Floyd's family and you're on Twitter and you see George being murdered and you're on Instagram and you see George being murdered and you're on Facebook and you see George being murdered. But the truth is that the world doesn't seem to care about police brutality victims unless their murder is filmed. There are too many victims that don't have a hashtag, that never got a headline, that won't have a protest. Um, and that's why we do need to push for officers to be severely disciplined, fired, and maybe charged with a crime if they turn that body camera off. So that's how I feel about body cams. I feel like the footage is crucial. Um, if they're, if they're shot outside of Salt Lake City, Sim Gill, our district attorney, won't give us the footage. Um, and I believe we should care about victims who are not filmed as well. Uh, Chief Brown, I want to give you the opportunity to respond, not about any particular case, but the 10-day disclosure, edited sound, um, you know, the video on a loop that continues to, to wound people in the audience. Is that... Is there policy in your department that holds police officers accountable in the way that Lex is advocating? Yeah, Jennifer, 
there is um, there are policies and reviews uh, to every uh, officer involved critical incident. I mean, if if an officer is involved in a shooting, um, they are investigated by an outside uh, team. Um, Salt Lake City has a team, West Valley has a team, and Unified PD has a team. So if we're involved in a shooting, they call in a separate team to investigate that. Um, we have nothing to do with it. Um, and so that team gathers the, the information, the evidence, and what, you know, they conduct the interviews. They then take that information and screen it with Sim Gill, the district attorney. Sim Gill will then make a ruling as to whether that force is justified or not. Um, there is also a review by our civilian review board, which is independent from Salt Lake City. They work for actually the human resource department, and they will actually do a, an investigation and look into that and make a decision or make a, a finding for the chief to review. So there are separate investigations to all these things that we're talking about. Okay, um, I wanna get to uh, the civilian review board. This from Jonathan, why doesn't Salt Lake City give greater power to civilian review boards? Um, do, they have, uh, do they have the independence they need? Do they have the support that they need? Um, Chief Brown, you said that they are outside of the department, so they are somewhat separate uh, and can do the audits, but do they have the power and do they, use that power in disciplinary fashion? Jennifer, you're asking me a question I can't answer. I don't know, they're independent of us. Um, I don't know. I know that the, they sit in the internal affairs uh, interviews. They're able to answer, to ask questions. They, they get the finding from Sim Gill. They take that back and they, they present that to the board. But uh, I'm, I can't answer that because they're not controlled by the, by the police department at all. Lex, you've got something to say. Teacher, teacher. Okay, go. Um, okay, so in our studying of the, the civilian review board in Salt Lake City, um, basically they investigate like misconduct. They do a full investigation. They, they make a decision as to what they think the punishment should be or the end outcome should be. Um, police are allowed to sit on this board, um, former law enforcement. Um, relatives of law enforcement are allowed to sit on this CRB. And then when they've made their decision, they give it to the chief of police. The chief of police takes that decision and he can decide whether he likes it or whether he's not going to accept that decision. He can, if they say fire this officer, like in the nurse Wubbles case, right? Um, he, he chose, I believe, to fire the officer in the nurse Wubbles case, but he could have chosen against that. Um, this board has no teeth. This board has no power. They do not have subpoena power. They do not have the power to fire. They do not have the power to bring charges. Um, to me, they're symbolic and it's fun. Hey, it's fun to pretend like they have power. Now, if you talk to anyone who sits on that board, because we have, they feel in their hearts that the chief of police takes their advisement to heart and that when they make a re recommendation to punish an officer, the chief of police listens to their recommendation and that they have a, a, a good relationship with the chief of police. And that's beautiful. And they feel like they have power, but I want real power. And I do not want police investigating other police. I do not want the relatives of police investigating other police. Um, and I've, I've studied civilian review boards across this country. Um, there are hundreds and th you know, there's possibly thousands of civilian review boards in this country. Um, some of them have power, some of them do not. Um, but the point of them is independent oversight of police. Who is policing the police? Because we cannot allow them to police themselves. Um, and and there was, there's a couple that were interesting, Portland and Seattle, I believe, that you know they set aside places on the review boards for Black Lives Matter, for the NAACP, for police brutality victims. Um, and so you know, what I'm pushing for is a democratically elected board 
in which we, the public elects the people. Most of the boards have the mayor or the city council um, place the people, but you know, long story short, um, no offense to the board, love you so much. Um, it's a joke. It is theatrics. It is not real. Those are harsh words, Chief Chapman. Um, I'm just curious about your experience in other jurisdictions. Did you see a civilian review board with uh, out the direct influence of uh, a police department? How, how has it worked in other places where you've lived and uh, and and worked? Pretty much as described, um, but I, I do think the one of the the things that's resonating with me with this conversation is police departments can, with the greatest intentions, um, change things, initiate things. Um, but it is a, a, until you have, just as was mentioned earlier, until you have people around the table who can look you face to face and share their legitimate perspectives, their legitimate experiences, their legitimate desires, uh, you may miss the mark with the greatest of intentions. And a lot of things that police departments do, the overwhelming majority of the folks and police chiefs and sheriffs are outstanding people with the greatest of intention, but we can miss the mark. I, I share the example oftentimes of I can make you the best steak dinner you've ever seen. And if you're a vegan, I missed the mark. And so what we're hearing in our the national narrative right now is people are saying our voices are not being heard. You're not listening to us. And so the civilian review boards, yeah, we need to reimagine how they look, but police can't reimagine that. It needs to be a collective conversation between the police and members of the community. Um, another question, Chief Brown. Um, uh, Gina is asking on Facebook, what about getting rid of qualified immunity? Do you want to explain exactly what that is um, and then your take on, on that idea? Qualified immunity would be as if, if uh, you're, you're sued as a law enforcement officer, um, if uh, the city will represent you and, and, and take, take on um, the, uh, the responsibility of, an, uh, of indemnifying you. Um, here's the thing, qualified immunity applies to not just police officers, but it applies to firefighters, it applies to many, many city workers. And so to get, I strongly feel that we shouldn't get away, we shouldn't do away with it. But qualified immunity doesn't mean that officers can't be charged with a crime. So, I mean, I think, I think people kind of lump those together and they're not. Um, but I don't think quali get, get, doing away with quali qualified immunity helps the situation that we're talking about right now. Hmm. How much does it protect them? Can I ask that question to the chief? How Please. much does qualified immunity protect the policeman? I'm not sure that there's a lot of protection. If somebody, if, if they, if they, if their conduct is so egregious and it's outside the scope of policy or law, I'm not sure the city would represent you. Uh, and, and it certainly wouldn't represent you if you've committed a crime. If you have a police officer that's been disciplined several times, is that available to the public? Doctor, I'm, I'm not following your question. Say that again. You have a police officer yeah. and say it's me, say it's me. And I have several disciplines on my record where you've disciplined me. Is that available to the public? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. You're talking about the internal affairs, uh, the history of, of their internal affairs, sustained complaints. Yes, absolutely. So why is it that uh, bad apples keep getting jobs in other departments? I think President Trump issued part of his executive order really targeting that, calling for a, a national database of disciplinary actions um, with grant money that's tied to that. So, I mean, we've seen cases here where police officers have misbehaved and then they've gone down the road 50 miles and gotten a job, no problem. Yes. Um, so are, are you sharing information? Is that kind of record following a person? You know, Jennifer, that needs to be fixed. That's a big problem. Um, 
what happens is officers will get in trouble and they'll start an internal affairs investigation and midstream an officer can say hey i'm done i'm out i've resigned and a lot of agencies won't finish the investigation now since i've been here we have finished the investigation and we have put something in their internal affairs uh, file that said had this continued it most likely would have been ended up in in, in a termination that way when another, when another agency comes to to look at our, the history they can see well oh yeah this individual resigned, but it was based on this. That needs to be part of this national misconduct registry that we're talking about. Uh, and we fully, we fully support that. A lot of times agencies will hide things in non-disclosure. Well, we've settled it. They left, but we can't talk about it. That's All right, wrong. Let me, let me pose a question to you, Chief. I'm a nurse. Let's just say I have a string of deaths that have been following me, and they find out that I'm the cause of them. But you know what? In the investigation, I decide to resign. So do you want me to still practice as a nurse? No. Right. And that's exactly the point we're making to you, that if you let someone resign and they can go down the street and get another job, that doesn't help me at all. That's not protecting me. I think that's the point we're making here. Right. But what I'm saying, doctor, is we, Salt Lake City, we will finish the investigation to the end and say this person resigned, but they would have been terminated. So that if they go somewhere else, I mean, if you're a nurse and you and you and, and, and like you just explained, you went to another hospital, wouldn't they look back maybe at your your history? Uh, and if it, it just showed that you resigned, there would be nothing there. That is happening, and that shouldn't happen. That's what I'm saying. There should be a finding in there uh, that that they were terminated, so that another agency. Doesn't doesn't hire them, so they shouldn't be in law enforcement. Hmm. Um, our, well, in my profession, you don't have to worry about it. I hope I'm not breaking up again, but if I do, I'll just try to come back in. But in my profession, I wouldn't have a license that would fix that. Right. In my profession, I wouldn't have a license that would fix that. I, but in your profession, they still have the ability to get hired again. So no, I. But it happens, Chief, it happens. Yeah, That's well, what, what she's talking about when she said they go down the road and get a job. Right, doctor, but what, what, what the, the state law requires agencies to report that to POST. POST will then do a, an investigation into their POST standing as a police officer, and they will take that certification away. Now, not every agency, uh, they need to be very consistent and very strict on reporting that back to POST, which we are here at Salt Lake City. So. You're talking about a system that really needs to be scrutinized and we need to follow it to a T and it needs to be across the board. We can't say, well, they do it this way or they do it this way. It has to be, we all do it the very same way. And that's back to what Lex was saying about making sure that you have community advisory boards to have some sort of power so they can hold you accountable because nobody is watching the storehouse. Nobody is, is watching and monitoring the chiefs and the heads of police from the from the top down. Cause you know, a fish rots, they tell me from the head down. So when you don't have someone watching the storehouse, this is the kind of thing that happens. What you're saying to me, it needs to be scrutinized. Well, if you've got the community there and they're, they're read and understand policing and understand leadership, they'll call you out on it. Lex, you got something? Sorry, 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 yeah. I wanted to talk about a few of the bills that I've heard about, these mythical bills that are coming down, right, on the Hill. Um, one of the bills, it will make it so that police officers who are terminated from one agency won't be rehired to another agency. Then we have the body cam footage uh, one. Then we have one getting the school resource officers out of the schools because police officers in schools mass incarcerate black and brown students. It's called the school to prison pipeline. Um, black and brown students are being arrested and sent to prison from school and that needs to not happen. Um, uh, there's another one. Oh, and, and, and with post now, now it's my understanding, this is a rumor, conspiracy theory. There is a conspiracy theory. There, there's a bill being thrown out that says they're going to rewrite the use of force policy for police officers in Utah. 
And if a police officer infringes upon that use of force policy, um, they will be referred to post who will investigate their misconduct and possibly decertify them and fire them. So again, this is a bill allowing police officers to investigate other police officers. This is a real bill. We know this is a bill that's being thrown out. The conspiracy is the police wrote this bill themselves. Uh, that's, the, that's the conspiracy theory I'm hearing. So I just wanna let people know, hey, we're going to see a lot of police reform bills this year and in the next session. Um, and I just want people to really read them and think to themselves when they're reading this bill, will this prevent mass incarceration of black and brown people? Will this bill save lives? Will this bill provide more transparency and accountability? Because I don't want the public to be thrown a trash bill. Here's a little fake bill for you. Now don't protest anymore. Um, I want us to use our heads and to use our hearts. And when we look at those bills, think to yourself, will this create change? Or is this meant to pacify our anger? Is this meant to placate us like we are children? Give her this to distract her. Give her this sucker. Give her this lollipop. This will distract her and we continue with the status quo. So I'm very excited about the bills. I wrote a bill, nobody likes my bill, but um, anyway, I like my bill. <laughs> well, I signed off on your bill, Lex. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, our time is, is very, very short. I just wanna ask one question for all four of you. How do we, how do you regain the public trust in law enforcement after a Bernardio Palacio or a Lauren McCluskey or a George Floyd? I mean, there are so many, how do you even start to rebuild uh, the trust that a police department needs um, in order to fulfill its, its mission and duty? And Chief Chapman, I'd love to hear from you first. Again, it starts with you have to acknowledge the role that your profession has played. Uh, anything that you do going forward, it has to be in conjunction, just as mentioned, that face-to-face, eye-to-eye, here's my real-life experience, and it can't be any token changes. And we have to have the ability to understand, we understand that things are broken right now, and things need to be fixed right now. But we also have to understand that it's a very complex issue that we're dealing with, with roots and tentacles in every fabric of our society that subjugates people of color. And so it's not going to happen overnight, but I, I'm confident and optimistic when I see um, people feeling engaged and, and people voicing their, appearance, uh, their experiences and getting their real life perspectives out here that we can start right now as in the in the path of making some systemic changes and progress. Uh, Chief Brown. Um, <clears throat> we need we need to listen. We need to uh, learn and we need to act to effectuate change. And, 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 and that sounds really easy. Three words, listen, learn, act. It's a lot of hard work. It's not one and done. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I've learned that lesson so many times and I've mentioned it. I learned that lesson from Reverend Davis when I first met him. Uh, and he, we had a long conversation and in, in one sentence, he taught me a sermon. He basically said, Chief, we've been here for 42 years. Where have you been? And, and that spoke volumes to me. And that's been my commitment that we would continue to work with the communities here in Salt Lake City so that we can come together. Um, I think it starts with transparency. Um, you have to be transparent because transparency builds trust. Trust builds relationships and relationships build inclusive communities. And it, it's, it's, it's something that you, you continually work with. Um, we talked a little bit about implicit bias. You have to recognize that we all have implicit biases. And it's really easy to hate from afar. You can sit it on your couch at home and say, I don't like those people for whatever reason. But like the doctor talks about, sometimes implicit bias training is short lived. You have to get off the couch, you have to get out of the squad room, you have to get into the community and you have to meet the people that you're serving. 
And when you do face-to-face, -face, a lot of those biases and those prejudices fall aside and we start seeing people for who we really are and we start becoming a better community and a better police department. Hmm. Uh, Professor, what will it take for you to trust this process? Uh, maybe she's frozen again. Um, I'm here. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. I hope I don't freeze up. It says my internet's unstable, but I'm going to start. The chief is right. I repeat what he says a lot about you can hate from a distance. It's a whole lot harder to hate close up. But until the police force is held accountable, like my profession is held accountable, I think we still are going to have problems. And the other piece is uh, someone monitoring you, the community is not necessarily monitoring, but we're a part of it. And if you don't hear me, Martin Luther King said, the voice when the, uh, the, the violence is the voice of the unheard. And when I am not heard by you, then I have to make a lot of noise. So I hope we don't have to continue to make a lot of noise. And I hope you will agree to make, give us a place in your life so that we can understand you're here to protect me. And I wanna feel comfortable with the people that are here to protect me. Just like you'd wanna feel comfortable with the person that's coming in to take care of you. You don't wanna to have to be afraid that that person is taking care of you is gonna do the wrong thing, that they are not going to be safe and that you might come out instead of your right leg being fixed, your right legs cut off. And if, some, if we were doing that, you'd be all over us for that. So we have to be held accountable. And so do you. Lex, I'm gonna give you the last word. I mean, how long is it gonna take? You have trust issues with law enforcement. <laughs> how long is it gonna to take to, for you to trust law enforcement again? Well, I just wanna say that Chief Chapman and Chief Brown are two of the most enlightened chiefs in the nation. Um, it takes a lot for a chief to stand up and say, I'm going to fight police brutality. I'm going to, I'm going to hold my police to a higher level. I get a lot of flack in the activist community. Um, they say I'm over here making out with chief Brown, um, cause I don't bash the chief of police, but, but it, to me, when you say I'm going to fight police brutality and I'm going to hold my officers to a higher standard. I appreciate that. So I appreciate that with you. And I, I just say that because I'm, I'm going to say something controversial right now. Okay. I, I wish there were no police in this country. I don't want there to be. And when white people see police, they immediately feel protected. And that is because police protect white people. White people. And, and when brown and black people see police, our heart sinks, is this, are we going to die? Is this my last five minutes of my life? Am I going to be mass incarcerated and thrown, have the book thrown at me? Am I going to spend the rest of my life in prison? Anyone who had worked in this Black Lives Matter movement with me for six years and shadowed me and read my emails from prisoners and inmates and had called me about police brutality and the mothers of police brutality victims and and the pain in their voice when they lose someone to police brutality and every week i have to take these calls from police brutality victims they will never say goodbye to their son they will never say goodbye to their daughter they will never see their mother or their father again um and the pain i carry it with me and it will never go away. I can't sleep at night. So um, I, I wish there were not police in this nation because the system is that broken. But while there are police in the nation, I will work with Chief Chapman. I will work with Chief Brown to try to get reforms and to try to hold police accountable for their actions. But when you ask me to trust the police, um, the police work for me. They're paid out of my taxpayer dollars. Um, I don't need to trust the police. The police need to do their job and actually protect black and brown people. I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, thank you for your candor and honesty. Uh, Lex Scott, Chief Brown, Chief Chapman, Diane McAdams-Jones, thank you all so much for participating with our discussion tonight. 
Hey, Jennifer, thank you so much for having me. (laughs) We're going to continue our series of town halls next Wednesday with a conversation focused on policy solutions. You got a little bit of uh, a preview tonight, and we're going to expand on that, and we hope you'll join us for that. That's it for our Trib Talk Town Hall. Thanks so much, and be well. Thank you. Thanks.